Welcome to the Trailer Park Podcast, where we go full throttle on faith, freedom, and cash flow. We dive in and have the real unfiltered conversations with industry professionals about buying deals and creating lasting passive income. I'd like to introduce uh, to everybody Enon Winkler, and I believe I'm pronouncing that right. And uh, you're a manufactured home and RV park broker, correct? That is correct. Yeah, I appreciate that. So yeah, man, my background, I, I got into real estate in 2004. I started with a company called Mark Similla Chap and focused on apartment complexes here in Orlando. And quickly, I became one of the, the, the top brokers within Marcus. As far, you know, in Florida, I was one of the top brokers. I think I was number three in the state, either between three and five within my second year. You know, from there, just continued to crush it within Marcus. I did extremely well within Marcus. And then, you know, after a few years, you know, some of the other groups came calling and, you know, I eventually ended up going over to another firm and, and working there for a period of time. And, and and what I realized is when I left Marcus that um the one thing that Marcus provided that I enjoyed was it was very entrepreneurial and there wasn't a box. So um went to work, you know, for another firm, uh, more of an institutional firm, and just kind of found out pretty quickly that um you know, though I like working on institutional deals, I just didn't like being in a box. So Fair enough. I continue to sell apartments um, probably through 2009-ish. And then um, as the market started to crumble, you know, with all that was going on at the time, you know, I kind of left the industry for a period of time and went out and worked on another business that I that I owned and built called Red Carpet Monday. And um, I built that up and then, you know, clients started calling back and I jumped back into the multifamily world probably in 2011. And when I jumped back into the world of multifamily, I then realized that, you know, through a client of mine that bought some mobile home parts that I sold to him, that there weren't a lot of great mobile home park brokers out there at the time. And I thought there was a niche to be able to really capitalize on what I'd done in the apartment space and the mobile home park in the RV space. And, you know, I started building that business in probably 2013. And ever since then, um, it's kind of been off to the races. So Love it. I've been... You know, I, I continue to focus on multifamily as well as mobile home parks and RV parks. And then I believe in probably 2016, um, I just transitioned to the mobile home park and RV space exclusively. Um, and that's where I've been ever since. I love it. So how much of your transactional volume is one or the other? Yeah, I've, I've done probably I've done north of $2 billion in sales. And I would say a billions on the apartment side and a billions on the MH and RV side. That would be pretty accurate. That's um, awesome. Yeah. So where yeah. are your main uh, main focus areas within the country? Yeah. So what I've done is, um, you know, in in two thousand, what was it, two thousand nineteen, I decided that I wanted to run my own firm, and that's when I started Other Street Advisors. And at that time, it was just me and one other guy, and you know, I built that up. And at that time, I was just kind of focused on, you know, just just building my firm and getting my track, keeping my traction and doing deals. And at that point, started to really focus on building my team. So 2019 was a pretty good year. 2020, I decided I was going to really start building my team. And then in, here we are in 2021. And I currently have two guys focused in Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, me, and Armand are really focused on the Southeast and the Midwest. I have my analyst that underwrites all of our deals and kind of focused with us kind of in that area as well in the Northeast. Um, recently hired a junior analyst, um, brought on a transaction coordinator at the end of last year. And I got another guy training now that's going to kind of focus on the Midwest. He's working with us now and I'm continuing to grow. You know, my goal would be, you know, where I need some expertise is, you know, more of the Colorado area north and to the West. And I'm looking to build my team there. And, you know, just in the meantime, I'm, you know, kind of running and gunning and doing deals throughout Texas, Southeast, Midwest, and Northeast. Oh, man, that's so cool. I love yeah. it. Uh, I, I, what I think is really cool about a national footprint is it keeps you, it keeps you fired up and learning and growing because there's so much there. There's so much to learn. Absolutely. You know, and like, that's where we're kind of having fun looking like, I'm like, what the heck? Like, how do you? How do you do this? Or how do you put homes in there? You know, how do you sell homes in these markets? It's kind of soft, you know, or whatever. It's just a little different. And like the Texas, the taxes, how do you deal with that? You know, yeah. <laughs> it's well, tricky. You, you learn as you go. I mean, there's, yeah. you know, it's um, 
you know, when, when I dealt in the apartment world, you know, I really sold, you know, 90% of my apartments in Florida. I sold, I sold, probably sold a hundred million in North Carolina at the time. But, you know, as I've really transitioned into all these other states on the MH and RD side, I mean, you're right. Taxes are different in each state. Who pays for titles different in each state. Political views on, you know, the MH and RD space are different in each space. So, I mean, you know, as you get into new territories and you grow, there is a lot of learning with respect to how things work and how things function. I mean, Texas, you know, that's a non-disclosure state, right? So, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's totally different than, you know, a lot of the other states where they want disclosure and so forth. So, um, yeah, you know, we've learned as we go and, you know, we've, we've really done a good job of taking notes on some of the states that we work in and, you know, on every deal we're having to call and say, you know, what happens if this sells, where the tax is going to go, how's this work? And so it's been a true learning experience, but you're right. I mean, it's, it's been exciting and, you know, you started to recognize you have very friendly states and you have very unfriendly states. And that's that's kind of the coolest part about it. So what would you, uh, what places would you recommend that are f- uh, friendly? And what would you tell somebody that's like starting out and growing? And then what, you know, what would, I'd love to hear your recommendation as to what you'd recommend we do coming from basically a, a Western Arizona footprint. Um, and where should we really focus in and how should we uh, square up on our growth? as we continue to pursue more deals elsewhere? Yeah, so I, I think that, like in, in my opinion, I think a lot of this rides on, you know, the, the, the political atmosphere within a state. So, you know, I can't tell you how many times over the past six months, you know, that you have a lot of people that are like, look, we won't touch blue states. We're just out. And then you have other groups going, you know, you know, we're only red states or we'll do some blue states. I mean, you know, we've done a few deals in Illinois. And Illinois just seems to be a very difficult place to, to do business from a mobile home park standpoint, from a political standpoint, from a taxation standpoint. So, you know, Illinois seems to be a tough state where, you know, if you look at North Carolina, South Carolina, you know, Texas, I mean, you know, they're, they're much more friendlier with respect to the political environment. So and it's, you know, it's interesting to see how a lot of people really trending towards the red states. I mean, you know, New York, the interesting thing is we sold four deals in New York last year, and that's probably one of the toughest states to do business because of rent control and, and taxes. But, um, you know, it's there's still a lot of activity in New York with respect to the buyers that own there. But new people going into New York, you know, it's, it's a lot smaller pool of buyers because they just, one, they don't understand it, and two, they don't like the political arena. So, you know, my, my recommendation is, is, you know, um, you, you want to focus on states that have great growth. I mean, Texas, Arizona, Florida, North Carolina, you know, Georgia's getting great growth. Tennessee is getting great growth. You want to follow the migration of, of what's important to, to, you know, people and where they're moving. But the flip side is when you look at Texas, Florida, Tennessee, I mean, you don't have any state tax. So, I mean, there's a lot of benefits to, to investing in those states and why people do invest in those states. So, you know, it's, it's definitely changing. Five years ago, when I was, you know, not new to the business, but somewhat so new to the business, um, you really didn't hear that much about this. But now it's 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 very prevalent that prevalent that people are really focused on, you know, friendly states to do business, and they're trying to stay away from the states that are not friendly to do business. Yeah, and I'm seeing that, and I'm feeling it too uh, from like our side and what we can kind of stomach when we when we square up and underwrite a deal. It's like oh man, you know, what are we going to be able to do with this? You know, and, and how, how long of a runway do we have left before we, our rent growth gets CPI'd? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's yeah. Like, uh, so it's kind of scary, especially if it's like, you know, we raise money with friends and family and organically. And it's, it's people that, you know, I, I would be like, Hey, I, I view it like family money. Like, Hey, it's my mom and my dad and my, my, uh, my wife's grandparents that are investing in these deals what do I feel comfortable purchasing and, and that we can actually perform with? And I like to view it that way in general anyways, you know? Well, I mean, so, and, and we'll talk, let's just touch on that real quick. I mean, and, and that's great. I mean, like there's nothing more appreciated. You got a fiduciary duty to buy. Right. Yep. So, and look, you know, the reality of it in some ways for some people, and I'm just saying in general, you know, whether it's your friends and family or whether it's an individual investor, you still got to take that very serious with respect to 
you know, it's their money. So like, right. I, you know, that's a very serious thing that you got to take into consideration. And, you know, um, I think it's great that, you know, you guys do that. And, you know, it's, you know, my concern sometimes is some of these larger funds out there and, you know, how they're buying and what they're buying, you know, they're, they're obviously smarter than I am in a lot of ways. <laughs> they have more data and whatever, but right. you know, some of these deals, I look at them and I'm just like, all right, you know, I get, I, you know, you're the big boy. I get it. So, you know, some things that they just understand better than I, and you know, they, they, they really probably dig into the macro and micro economic trends and all that stuff as well. But, you know, with that being said, anyone out there raising money, and this goes to anyone out there raising money, you got a fiduciary duty to your people. Don't forget that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. So what what do you think about Tennessee? I like Tennessee because I think that, you know, there's a, you know, there's a huge demand for affordable housing wherever you want to look. Um, I just think that, you know, there's a lot of people migrating from the north to Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, you know, Florida and um you know, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity in Tennessee because, you know, I think in the past, what I've seen in Tennessee is I've seen a lot of parks that really need someone to come in and love on them a little bit. You know, you got these parks that, you know, are owned by long-term operators. And, you know, eight years ago, seven years ago, people weren't that excited about Tennessee, for example. But now there's just a lot of opportunity to go in there and make a difference to these communities, you know, upscale and rehab them, you know fix the infrastructure, raise the rents to where they should be. But taking care of the people, I just think there's been a lot of opportunity in Tennessee. And and that's why I like it. And, you know, I've seen good rent growth there. And, and you know, when I'm talking to investors, you know, Tennessee pops up a lot. So cool. Yeah, I I have a a few family friends that have moved out to either Knoxville or the Nashville metro. um, And they're like, man, they couldn't be happier to be out there. Well, Knoxville is a great town. I mean, Nashville is a great town. I mean, it's just, yeah. You know, those are just two amazing places. I, you know, if I could go to Nashville two or three times a year, I would because I just love it. And Knoxville, I mean, you go to Knoxville and there's so much freaking spirit there. It's just amazing. It's just, you know. So what, what's, uh, what does that have? What is Knoxville? I've never been there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Knoxville is the University of Tennessee, right? Am I, am I wrong on that? Right? No, no, no. But I'm, I'm ignorant on that realm. So like, yeah, if it's I mean, a cool town yeah. and it's dialed in for that reason, then that's, that must be, it must be buzzing. Yeah. And it's beautiful there. I mean, it's yeah. beautiful. It's on a river. I love the water, like all the rivers that go through. Sure. Tennessee. It seems like a really cool lifestyle. Um, are, you, are you guys focused on Tennessee right now for acquisitions? Well, it's just one of our states. I'd say we're looking extremely hard at Nevada, Texas, and then the the North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida. And then yep. I, like, I like Tennessee in there if we can... If we can add that in, and then I, I'm ignorant to a lot of Georgia too, because you know I've been in my bubble over here in the West, and it, see, it's like once you get beyond the Rockies, it gets it like everything changes a little bit to where I, I'm I'm really having fun exploring all of it right now. Well, you know Georgia, for example, I mean I've done a lot of transactions in Georgia, and you know you know Atlanta's Atlanta. I mean, and everyone's going to want to be in Atlanta, but then when you start to get into the outskirts of you know Atlanta. What, what you'll find is, in my opinion, you got to be careful, but there is a lot of opportunity there. So, you know, when you get down kind of in the Albany market or the Tifton market, you know, you'll notice that the population growth is smaller. I mean, Albany is a pretty decent sized market. But when you and, and I've sold eight deals in Albany, those four deals, and then I sold again four more deals. But, you know, when I sold these deals in, in Albany originally, I mean, the average lot rent was one hundred and seventy dollars. Right. Wow. I mean, it's hard to make sense of anything at one hundred and seventy dollars. And but, you know, now when you look at what's happened in all me, you know, the average lot rents more along the lines of probably two sixty. So, you know, people that bought it for one seventy and got to move to the two sixty, there's been a huge benefit of that. And, you know, and, and a lot of places within Georgia still have lot rents in the one eighty to two twenty range. So there. There's opportunity there with respect to upside and rents, but you still got to pay close attention to, you know, the demographics and the income and the, you know, the home pricing because, you know, sometimes that's all you can charge. You know, you can do a po don't come in Georgia and, you know, 180s, you know, can you go to 200? Sure. Can you go to 240? Yeah, you're, you're, you're probably pushing, pushing a little bit. So, yeah. 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 Well, it, I, I call that like I love in in our model and like, anything that's pretty cheap, like storage, mobile home parks, RV parks, but anything like under 500 bucks, 
if you can, if, if the market goes on a run in pure numbers, you're winning, you know, like in that 180 to 260 percentage wise, that's an incredible bump on rents and to sure. your own mind. So now your NOI is just juiced and you're, sure. you, you know, you're having a good time. <laughs> well, and those markets, I mean, if you look back, I mean, you know, because the buyer pools are smaller in those markets and have been now they're that that's growing. I mean, people right now, it's, I feel like it's kind of a land grab out there. Any decent park that looks decent, it's kind of a land grab. But, you know, you look back and you look at this 170 lot rent park and, you know, you could buy that at an eight or a nine cap, you know, five years ago. So you take that eight or nine cap and then you take those lot rents to 260 and you compress that down to a six cap. I mean, I mean, that's that's millions of dollars. Yes. Yes. We We kind of experienced that with Tucson. We sure. were in Tucson pretty early. And, uh, and so we were paying like 30, 35,000 a pad, which is, I'd say was normal a handful of years ago, four or five years ago. And now parks are, you know, trading for north of 70. And it's just getting crazy. We only had that crystal ball. <laughs> oh my gosh. And so we're, we're like super happy with those and rents and like all the, we're, like I, I'm, I'm really starting to track the multi guys in that if they go in and start hitting a value add old apartments really hard, they're going to drive all the rents up. And so then yeah. they open up a little more room for us to continue moving forward. And uh, so it's been good down there. Tucson's on fire right now with the multifamily realm. Well, they're, they're kind of chasing each other, right? You know, it's like, you know, you, you're chasing, the multifamily guys are looking for good demographics. So they can go in there and do the value add. And, you know, you're smart for kind of watching them going, okay, there's been nine trades in Tucson, you know, and, you know, two, two class A projects and, you know, three B class projects and three C and the B and the C they're totally going to get renovated and boost rents by 75 to $150 or whatever it is. And then you're kind of looking at that going, you know, what's going to follow mobile home park rents. Right. I mean, you know, ultimately people, you know, they they kind of, I don't want to call them getting priced out of the market, but in the apartments, I think they are kind of getting priced out of the market. Yeah, no, it's getting, I mean, it's crazy. We live in East uh, San Diego and it's like, I could have rent, uh, <laughs> I've actually got plans and everything permitted on a lot and like locally here to put a double wide modular, basically okay. a double wide on it as a, as an accessory dwelling unit. That whole thing yeah. in California is on, is insane. And, uh, they waive all the fees and everything. And I can get like three to 3,500 bucks a month for a mm-hmm. three bedroom, two bath house, kind of, you know, 20, 25 minutes east of downtown San Diego. It's just crazy. Well, yeah. It's, and, and you talked a minute ago about like, I mean, I remember when I got into this business, I mean, even in Florida, I remember like I had some listings on like a 55 and older park in the Ocala area. I couldn't give it away. I mean, I had to think, listen, I'm like, why won't anyone buy this? And I mean, today, and, and that was at probably 27 estates. Okay. I mean, now that thing would trade for 80 and I would probably have 20 offers on it. I mean, it's just insane. It's insane. It's, it really is. It, it's kind of, it's a weird, I have a mental battle of like, should I stay or should I go? It's like, where do, where do we go with this? Because yeah. it's scary out there. Yeah. Uh, in that if you, if we were to sell something and try to trade up right now, and like even just on a personal, like a home front, like, do you sell a home or do you hold? And it's like, cause it's just weird. The whole market is so frothy in every direction because of, I, I guess I'm assuming it's because of the, the, um, the printing of the money, the creating all of the debt and just continuing to run the national debt up vertically, you know, it's just creating insane buyer momentum. Well, I mean, I think that has something to do with it, but I think the biggest thing, I mean, you know, if you go back, you know, you go back and you look at 2013, I mean, you're, you were ecstatic to get debt at 7%. Yeah. Right. Yes. But today, I mean, so, so, I mean, it's, it's a factor of debt too. So today when you're, you know, able to get debt, you know, we'll call it 3% range. I mean, whatever it is, give yeah. take, um, depending on the deal. I mean, I, I should run a calculation on this, but, you know, if you run your debt at seven and a quarter, or let's just call it six. And then if you run your debt at three, I don't think it cuts it in half perfectly, but it cuts, the, I mean, it's a big difference. So, you know, the the debt, in my opinion, is what what's really driven prices and the the fact that it's affordable housing. I mean, you know, yep. it's affordable housing 
I've always said it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere and we need it more than ever. Um, so, so long as debt continues to stay where it is, you know, I think there's going to continue to be huge demand, strong demand. And we may even see cap rates continue to compress because of all the money out there chasing deals. Yeah. Um, my biggest concern is, you know, what happens in seven years, 10 years when that balloon comes due? And what if debt's back at seven and a quarter? I mean, you know, we got inflation kicking in, we got rent growth kicking in, I get all that. But um But you're you know, gonna basically be break even on your your debt. You might be able to refi, but that's it. You're not gonna be pulling any money out. Well, sure. And so I mean, you know, so that's where that's where again, if we had that crystal ball, but you know, I think, you know, anyone out there in the short term that's kind of, you know, fixing and flipping, I think they're fine. I think anyone with a long term hold mindset's fine. But, you know, I, I'm curious to see, and I hope this doesn't happen, but, you know, I, I wonder if some people get stuck five to seven years from now because, you know, all of a sudden they're having to refinance and their debt service coverage is tight and, you know, they got to put money into the deal. And, you know, what if they have a catastrophic event during the way? What if they have a wastewater treatment plant that has to be replaced? Or what if they have a lagoon that has an issue? Or, you know, what if they have just a large capital expense? I mean, that's where you know, because a lot of these parks, and, and I just want to point this out because this is where I see, I think I see some of the mistakes being made in just my opinion. But a lot of these parks were built a long time ago. Oh, man. And, you, you know, you roll up to some of these parks and you meet with the owners and I always kind of say this and it's funny, but, you know, you meet with a guy that's 84, that's owned it forever. And he's like, I got the best infrastructure ever. And every time, like, every time. And you roll over to the pipe and you got duct tape around it. And you're like, well, wait a minute. So my point is, is, you know, these parts built in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even 80s, we're in 2021. I mean, you know, when you ran electrical lines back in the day, they didn't put it in conduit. So what happened is these electrical lines over time, because of, you know, the weather and, you know, the moisture, they weren't in conduit. So these electrical lines, they deteriorate. And then you got to start replacing a lot of electrical lines. And it's expensive. Oh, man. So, so now you got to put it in conduit and you got to, you know, and you got to get it, you know, permitted. And then the next thing, you know, you're paying, you know, $2 a square foot for electrical line. I mean, and it's, you know, you're, you're having CapEx that's, you know, seven to 12 grand a year that you weren't expecting. So these are the things that I think that I would be cautious about. I think you're right. I think a lot of uh, uh, operators, you know, coming from multi, like if you were like a lot, I feel like a lot of the new money that's chasing deals in our industry is coming from apartments or somewhere like that. And so, yeah, it's just a new game with these old, these old properties. And like we, we're doing a $2 million sewer and water project right now on, in East Mesa. And it was on 30, it, it still is on th- 32 septic systems with Orangeburg sewer main. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, that thing is, is literally a, you know, what storm. And it's just like, you know, things coming out of the ground, turds floating in the street, if you're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you know what Orangeburg was until you bought it from a home park? Oh, no, no way. I didn't know what really what Orangeburg was until this deal. Orangeburg and, uh, sounds great. We'll take it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Oh, what did I get myself into? And I budgeted... Uh, I budgeted a lot of money, but I didn't budget enough. So we'll end up, you know, we fortunately it it's it wasn't in horrible shape. It just wasn't going to last, and so we planned for it. We got enough uh, homes. It was forty percent vacant, so we floored a ton of homes, and so the income's up. So we're going to be able to get a supplemental and finish and do a brand new sewer. We tied it into the main sewer line. We did all of it, so we get it'll be done in the next year. But it's a two million dollar project. Sure. And well, then it'll be shiny new and it'll be institutional quality. And the value add on that is insane. And we bought it for 9 million and it'll be worth 25 probably. Nice. Yeah. So. But, the, but the thing that you said that I think is important is obviously talking to operators and so forth all the time is that, you know, when you go in and you budget for that conversion, I'm of the opinion, man, you got you to tack 20% onto that. And I know that sounds crazy, but... I mean, I agree with you. If we were back in 2011 when nothing was going on, you're good. But right now, labor's up. Every, you know, supplies are up. So, and where does that go? I don't know. So, if you take that number and you tack on 20% or something, you got to have a buffer. Oh, I couldn't agree more because I've personally missed on that 
And I, you know, we, we dug into more, more or less all of our contingency funds that we budgeted sure. in reserves to finish. But so now I'm, I'm, I'm creating a huge buffer on, on those specific items, especially the CapEx, uh, the AC on the clubhouse that needs to be redone, uh, you know, anything electrical, all the pedestals, all the, we got, we got hit with a, a couple of clubs on electrical, you know, like these, these systems were never geared for hundred to 200 amp uh, single wides or double wides or all electric double wides or, you yeah. know, like in Arizona, when you're running the AC, you need that 200 amp. Well, the infrastructure isn't, it was never designed to support that type of load. It was 50 amp RV max. Well, so you're just hitting on the complications that I think that, you know, as, as, and let me say this, as those of you that watch the podcast and you're, and you're new to the business or you're somewhat new to the business, I mean, you're hitting the nail on the head on, things that could really bury you quickly because I mean, you're, you're fortunate, right? You, you guys, you guys reserved a lot of money and, and you probably did a lot of homework on the front end and got quotes. The challenge is, is by the time you bought it, you got ready, you got to the point to do it. Supply costs went up, contracting costs went up. But my point is, is, you know, for you guys out there looking to get into your first part, third part or whatever, as you grow in this business, you're just going to realize that no matter what you budget, it's probably never going to be enough. <laughs> and, and, and you just, you don't want to be way off because if you are, it's a problem. So, you know, it's, it's that, that would be my best advice to the guys out there. And, and just know that, you know, if you're buying a 1970 park, you're going to run into infrastructure issues, whether you like it or not. So it's going to happen. I couldn't agree more. We've hit, we've, bu- we've basically bumped into everything that you mentioned and then some, and like, Water wells, uh, septics, uh, sewer treatment plants, like all that stuff is is extremely expensive. So you and have me, to do your homework. Let me add one more thing to that because this, this, again, goes back to the government. The other thing that happens in this thing is the reality of it is, is that it's not the zoning, but the requirements today are much more stringent than the requirements were back then. And anytime you're doing an upgrade, and you're coming to today's code, it's totally different and it's expensive and they're going to make sure you do it to code unless you go do it when you're not looking. And On a Saturday. That's a, that, that's, a, that's a business choice. You make your own decisions there. But right. my point is, is, you know, when you're getting into a big project, sewer, water, electrical, the codes have changed and just know that it's, it's, it's going to be expensive. But, you know, it doesn't mean you can't make money. You just don't want to get caught with your pants down you know, with a hundred thousand dollar budget of CapEx and it's four hundred because then you've raised your money. Who's gonna put in the three hundred? You're gonna have nope. pissed off investors because you knew a capital call. So just be careful. And I, I, I think on those specific <laughs> items, even if you get a clean bill of health, you and you kind of like, okay, I'm gonna need, you know, twenty five grand a year for this septic system that comes with the park. It's like, okay, that's what they've been spending. It's like I would I would say on those particular items, double it. For the first couple of years, at least, yeah, you want to because you, you just have unknowns, and and they and sure, sure enough, to your point, they're BSing you on the evaluation, or you you didn't dig in all the way because it was just a quick look. It wasn't like a, they're in there in their you know knee deep in the stuff, and they're trying to figure out what's really going on with it. They're pumping it. They're like looking. It's like oh, this this whole leach field is is clogged actually now that we're in here. So you just uncover so much more in the first. I, I I think the first twenty four months and you really got your arms around it, but before then you need you need to pad everything. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's um, yeah, it's it's just one of those things where uh, just be cautious and just make sure that you reserve some money and you know what if you don't use it you can give it back to the investor. Yep, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, you can always you can always just yeah send them some money back. It, They'd love it. It sucks getting a capital call, just so you know. I, we've been lucky and we haven't, and or blessed, we haven't had to do a capital call, but we have personally loaned the community's money through the, through the management uh, company. Uh, and, and you're doing that so you don't have to do a capital call. And that was early on, on little things that like when we had a well and it's like, holy hell, we got to rebuild the whole well. And it's yeah. 35 grand on a, on a small deal. And then you get, yeah. you know, you get bigger. It just keeps getting uh, bigger and bigger. So sure. Well, so yeah, that's that's fun stuff, and you live and you learn, and you go down the road. Uh, something that I'd really like to kick around with you is uh, how do we take this, you know, MH and RV as an industry? How do we take it into the future? 
what do you see as like a big opportunity, like whether it be uh, technology, you know, rent manager, uh, automation, home quality, does uh, new development deals that you're seeing on the horizon? I'm hearing a lot of talk about development. So I'm just curious, how do we take the industry into the future from your perspective? Well, I'm a huge believer in technology. Um, I use Rent Manager. I love Rent Manager. I've never used the other one, so I can't compare them. But I've just always been happy with Rent Manager, so I've stuck with it. And you know, I think that technology is going to play a very large part on how we communicate with residents quickly and efficiently. You know, a lot of people right now are going to majority all online pay. I mean, so and let yeah. me just give you an example why that makes sense. You know, you have a community, right? Your manager collects rent every month. Well, that's great. That's how we've always done. It. But the flip side is when you go to your property and your manager is sitting there talking to someone for an hour or shooting the shit, and then, you know, and, and they got work to do. Well, when people come in to pay rent, they want to talk. So then all of a sudden your manager's having 10 minute conversation here, 30 minute conversation there. And, and you need that for the community. But when you really push people to pay online, you really can have your manager more focus on what they need to focus on, reporting, getting bills paid, whatever they do, violations, whatever it is. So yeah. I think that's been a huge enhancement to the mobile home park space is giving them the ability to pay online. They have these cards that you can go pay at Walmart, Target. I mean, that's another big thing. But yeah, I think from a technology standpoint, water meter. <laughs> reading, um, <laughs> right, 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 right. I mean, like yeah, uh, I Zigo, think, what is it? Zigo, the, all the electronic kind of yeah. inputting systems for rent manager. We're, we're just switching to all that currently. Yeah. So I think, I think technology is going to be very beneficial. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to capitalize on the, on the technology. I mean, you know, I was reading the other day and this was more to the apartment world, but I felt like it was relevant to the mobile home park world. And what it was saying is there's still good deals out there. So the apartment world, you know, there's every, you know, there's more competition. It's super tight. Yep. But they were saying there's still good deals out there for people that can effectively operate with technology and can capitalize on the things out there and makes the community better. So yep. what they're essentially saying is, is that, you know, if you don't have good process procedures, you don't use technology to its fullest, you know, you could you could run into some issues based upon what other people are doing and why they can pay more based upon this, why they can't pay more and how they're doing things. So I think technology is a huge one. The other thing you mentioned too, I mean, I do see development coming back. I've seen strong, strong, strong development come back here recently on the RV side, but we are seeing it come back on the mobile home park side, especially in Florida and Texas. Um, and those just happen to be two states that I really focus on. But, you know, in Florida right now, there um, recently was a, a brand new community built, you know, over in the, over in the, Fort Myers area. Um, okay. There's currently another one being built in the Melbourne area. I mean, there, there's more, but on the RV side, you know, we're seeing those pop up all over Florida and Texas. So, you know, I think there's going to be, I, I think that the opportunity to, to really capitalize on things is to develop, but you got to be able to withstand, in my opinion, on the development side on the mobile home park space you know, a four to five year horizon of the infill and the yep. and the time and the cost it takes for the infill. So the reality is, I mean, you look at these institutional deals in Florida, you can build these for, we'll call it 40 a lot. I mean, and I'm, ball, I'm spitballing, 35 sure. to 45. Yeah. All in. But these are selling for 140, 150 a lot. So, but then you have your hold period in which, you know, you got to reserve for your holds and so forth. So that 40 may be in, you're all in at 55 because of the hold. But if you're in for 55 and you're selling at 140 today, well, it could be 190 tomorrow. I don't know. Right. But my point is, you know, that's a big spread and there's a lot of money to be made. And, you know, you're building a brand new park. And with a brand new park, you know, you don't have infrastructure issues typically. Uh, I love it. You know, you have a nice looking community. You know, you have people that want to live there because all the homes look the same. You don't have an old home, new home, old, old, new. So there's a lot of benefits to that. But um, I think there's a lot of opportunity in that. And 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 that, you know, my opinion, I still think there's opportunity in what's built now and, and capitalizing on that. But the people that are, you know, getting ahead on this development side, I think you're going to do really well. Yeah, I agree with you. But it is a, it is a, I'd consider it a more established business play because yeah, you have a lot of risk that you wouldn't otherwise have and just buy an existing for smaller startup type guys that are just getting into the game. 
but yeah, I think the key on that, the problem that you run into is you got to understand your cost. Yep. You know, so you got to, you got to bring someone on board, whether it's a GC or a partner that really understands the cost. And, and that's the same with even operating a park. I mean, you have one electrician that'll give you a bid for five grand and another electrician to give you a bid for three and another one give you a, a bid for four and you're going, well, what's the difference? So, you know, understanding the cost of what you're doing and then being able to back in into it to know what their margin is. And, you know, they got to make money, but at the same time, I mean, you know, three grand to five grand is a big difference. And if you go get free quotes, you're going to be all over the board. So understanding your cost is huge. Yep. And, and then absorption on your point is huge. Sure. And I, you know, I've been kicking that around, but I think, I think I'd probably floor a bunch of them and rent them or, that, or you know, and just rent them and then convert them later upon turnover or something of that nature. Cause yeah, it's, it's hard to get bodies in them. If you're the financing realm, you, are you seeing anything on the financing front of like other than 21st mortgage or somebody coming in? I, I was talking to somebody else the other a couple of weeks ago and they're saying that there's some new banks coming in, starting to play along with the uh, resident loans for homes. Yeah. So, I mean, there's triad, there's 21st. I mean, there's a bunch of groups out there and they're all kind of similar with respect to how they do it. Um, you know, the challenge in that is, you know, you're looking at the, the end user, the person moving into the home. I mean, depending on their credit, you know, they could do it with zero down, 5% down, 10% down, 15. It depends on their credit. Right. But then, you know, your interest rates are six and three quarters, seven and a half, eight. So, I mean, and their AM typically, you know, 15, 15 years, 12 years, right? So it, it makes it a little bit more difficult where the banks, I mean, you know, when you go to the bank and I don't know how much more creative they're getting on the bank side, but the bank's typically on a mobile home going to want 20% down on a 10 year AM. So, um, but their interest rate is going to be more favorable. So, you know, there's, it's, it's just been a challenge. I mean, I wish, you know, I hear that, you know, and, and you know, I, I should probably double check on this, but I hear Fannie's, you know, kind of into the space so long as the home's built to a certain spec. Um, right. But if Fannie would come in and start lending on these, I think it would change the whole dynamics of our industry. And I think it would really explode. And I think values would just go through the roof then. I agree. I'm, I'm really hoping for Fannie to completely step in, especially with operators guarantee it, like the cash program with 21st. Yep. Like we would happily as operators back the performance of those notes that are originated. You have to, you have to with 21st. Right, right, right. But I mean, with Fannie, with Fa- oh. if Fannie came in and did it, do the same thing at a little bit more competitive, affordable rate, create some healthy competition. I love 21st, you know, but yep. you know, we need some competition. I think that 21st kind of has a, a, a pretty good monopoly on that particular piece right now. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, I love those guys that we do a lot of business with them. Uh, but yeah, all in the all in the uh, effort to get it more affordable for the end user, and we'll back it, and we'll you know yeah. we'll pay it yeah. off at face value and re re originate a new loan to somebody else. Uh, absolutely, and look, twenty first. I mean, thank God, twenty first and Triad and them are out there. I agree with you, but um, you know, I have conversations with twenty first and Triad about it all the time. I'm like, you know, it's 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 three points on the front end and you know, eight and a quarter interest rate. And I'm like, ah, that's, you know, it's like, come on guys. I but know. you know what? It, they're, 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 they're there. And it's great that they're there and, and they're doing what they need to do for their risk tolerance levels at the time. And you know, it, it's, I'm not complaining. I agree. I agree. We have a ton of business that we do with them and I'm, I, I'm very thankful. All right. Well, uh, last question and we'll wrap up cause we've covered some good ground here. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, hopefully we'll we'll have some fun kicking some deals around in the future and get some absolutely with you. I'm excited, yeah. uh, and I'll come out to your neck of the woods. And so you live and base out of Orlando. I am cool. I am well. You and Ian are competition, it, you, and Kevin uh, with Capstone. Yeah, you I, guys are. I, I started Capstone's mobile home park division. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, well, that's neat. I'll have to hear that history. I I, I, I trained Kevin. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, good, listen, good, good guys. Um, you know, I just independent was my thing, and I wanted to go do my thing. And you know, they're they're great guys, and you know, they're doing a great job. So it is what it is. Yep. And every market needs a little competition. You yeah, know? man. Got to trade pain every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So wrap up question. I love to understand uh, everyone's perspective of the, of the financial realm that's in our industry. So you just hit the lottery, or you got handed a ten million dollar check, but no taxes, you know, no BS. It's clean 10 mil. What would you, what would be your allocation 
and anything's included. Uh, mobile home parks are obviously mostly included in the answer, but it doesn't have to be. Could sure. be apartments or whatever, or or Bitcoin. I hear a lot of uh, <laughs> I hear a lot of guys answer about crypto. So whatever your answer is, it'd be just neat to learn. Well, I mean, I think the crypto thing is interesting, but the challenge is, is you can only understand so many things, right? I mean, and you know, it's like you're kind of you're kind of gambling if you don't understand it. And I don't know if anybody really understands Bitcoin or, or whatever, but it's, yep. I can tell you that's been amazing. It's had amazing runs. So good for it. But if I had $10 million, I mean, the, the honest answer is, is so my background, I was a trader on Wall Street. I was what's called a market maker. So okay. I was the guy that was, you know, executing on the floor, you know, buy, sell, you know, 10,000 shares of Dell. And I'm like, all right, I sold you 10,000 shares of Dell at a dollar making it up. You know, so I was, I've been in that world. I was in that world for five years. And, you know, my response to the stock market is I've been in it a little bit, but I, you know, I haven't reaped the rewards of the ups and downs and ups. So I just think it's legalized gambling. That's my opinion. Now, and I'm a, I'm a touchy feely brick and mortar type guy, but you know, where I see the opportunity right now is, is I would continue to invest in mobile home park space. I would also, I mean, I like the car wash business. Hey, there's a, there's a new one. You know, it's, I've seen some of the returns in the car wash business. You know, they're starting to, I think the secret's out of the bag a little bit, but I still think there's opportunity to pounce. Um, I know a couple guys in Orlando that have sold out of the mobile home park space and invested in the car wash space, similar to a value add car wash. You know, it's an old car wash, been there for 20 years. It's tired. They go in, you know, re-sign it, repaint it, redo the, and, and they're just doing extremely well. So. I like the car wash business a lot. And and I think the other thing that that I like, I mean, in the development side, but that's a whole other niche. But I think that, you know, I, I'm starting to kind of pay attention to the smaller mom and pop retail centers. Because, you know, retail has been hit. Yep. And with everything coming back, I think you can get stuff at a pretty decent discount, potentially. Um, and if, you know, people that you know, own a, a nail salon or own a Chinese restaurant or own, you know, some business they're in, they're going to fight till the end to make sure they stay open. Yep. So, you know, I think on the retail front, good quality location, look for gentrification of where things are growing out to. Um, I think if you can buy some retail these days, you know, at a good price, I think there's going to be some, some good deals out there. Um, but, it, you know, I love the mobile home park space. I'm, I'm in it and you know, I invest in it. I'm partnered in it. You know, I invest through other people in it. So um, I love it. And, you know, I believe in it. So, well, cool. Well, just to, to throw it out there, we'll, we'll put you, if you'd like to be included on our offerings, we always invite uh, industry people in. So you could check out our deals that we do. Yeah, if you send me, you got a PPM you can send me? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm in three different PPMs with three different groups now and um, always looking. Cool. All right. Awesome. Well, yeah. so give me give me a quick percentage breakdown, just shooting from the hip. How yeah. how much would you put into mobile home parks, car washes, retail, well, you name it? Yeah, eighty percent mobile home parks. Well, let me go back. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna say sixty percent mobile home parks. All right. Twenty percent RV parks, and RV parks have been the flavor of the month for a little while. I mean, yeah. they're on fire. Yep. Um, ten percent car wash, ten percent retail. I like it. Cool. But affordable housing isn't going anywhere, and I love. It. I know. Me too. Yeah. I love it so much. All right. Well, hey, you know, it was really great talking with you and getting to know yeah, you a little bit. And th- and when I make it down to Florida, I'm trying to get my uh, wife and baby out there and to just go explore around. So when I'm out there, we'll have to grab a quick bite or a dinner or something. Yeah. When you come here, man, just let me know. And um, you know, I'm local. Been here a long time, so I can guide you in the right direction. I'll be more than happy to meet up with you guys. Love it. All right. right. Thanks a lot for joining us on the Trailer Park Podcast, boy. Yeah, man. Have a good day. Thank you. All right. That wraps up the Trailer Park Podcast. Hit the subscribe button for some more great industry professional conversations about buying trailer parks. Trailer Park.